Well, let's uh, let's bring on the uh, the former Washington quarterback, former Seattle Seahawks quarterback, played for the Indianapolis Colts as well. Uh, the one and only Brock Heward. Brock, how you doing? I'm doing good. I'm doing good. I'm ready uh, to get this game kicked off, though. I don't know if you two are uh, down there in Texas, ready to ready to go. Because golly, five five weeks or whatever it's been is too long a layoff for me. <laughs> well, we were just talking about the fact that uh, the Texas defensive coordinator Pete Kwiatkowski, who you know, yep, uh, from his days in Washington, and uh, the Texas defensive players spoke this morning, and. You know, you got this matchup between Tavondre Sweat and Byron Murphy and the Joe Moore award winning offensive line, um, Brock. And one thing that was pointed out to me is that Washington's center, freshman yes. Parker Brailsford, is 275 pounds. Yes. Tavondre Sweat almost yes. outweighs him by 100 pounds. Yeah, and uh, I remember, let's see, I had Texas twice this year. I had him in the opener versus Rice, where it was like 190 degrees, one of the hottest days I can ever remember. And then we had him at a night game down in Ames, Iowa, late in the year at Iowa State, kind of get over that hump and get to double-digit wins, which Steve had not done at any point in his career. And, and they took care of business in Ames and got that job done. And we sat the night before the game with Tavondre. And if you know me, I'm a left-handed middle child, kind of a weirdo, and uh, do radio every day. And so I like to have some fun every once in a while, maybe a, a sense of some sarcasm. And we sat in the Ames Marriott, and Devondre walked in. I mean, just blocked the whole door when he walked in. He sat down, and and I pulled out my little board here. In fact, here you go. This is my uh, my game board on there with all my different notes. And I looked down, I put my glasses on. I said, now, Devondre, on my board, I'm looking at, Six foot four and 325. <laughs> and, he, and he said, what'd you say? 325? No, 365. And I'm like, oh, I'm sorry. I read that wrong. 365. So, yeah, he's a big old boy. And Parker is a redshirt freshman center. Is going to be giving up a lot, a lot of weight, certainly, to that man. Yeah. And Brock, talk about Steve Sarkeesian. Obviously, you saw him in a different part of his life and his mm -hmm. career. And to see where he is now, it must be just kind of crazy for somebody like you that covered them during this time at UW. But a lot of people just kind of had their, oh, we don't know how he's going to be. Was this the right hire for Texas after Tom Herman and stuff like that? And as you said, a guy that now has his first 10-win season, got his team in the college football playoff, he's come very very far in his career. Yeah, he's always been one of the best play callers and coordinators. There's a reason why Nick Saban for years and years wanted him uh, part of his program. And, and obviously he went from SC where I got to know him originally. Heck, Steve and I played against each other. I was a redshirt freshman at Washington in 1996. And the only loss on that team schedule for BYU was a trip to Seattle. They were 13-1, and one, I believe, that year, but lost us up there. So I saw him all the way back to when he was a player at BYU and then through the years as a coordinator at SC and then the head coach at Washington. And through all of those, you knew that just, um, just his brain – uh, his processing, uh, his building of an offense was top notch. And as I said, why I think Steve covered or Saban coveted him um, for some time and then ultimately, you know, ran into some trouble off the field and and some uh, some significant issues there at USC, rebuilds himself in the NFL, rebuilds himself with Nick Saban, wins a national title and uh, kind of revisiting again back to see in Texas twice this year, guys, when we saw them in the opener. And the day before the game, I walked into their indoor facility. I was like, wow, this is not a Washington Sarkeesian team. This is not a USC Sarkeesian team. This is a Nick Saban, Kirby Smart, Alabama, Georgia team. I mean, they were grown men. They spent their time in the weight room. You could see it with their builds. You could see it with their bodies. They're not a fat offensive lineman. They're not a, a defensive lineman in their top eight that didn't have big old ham hocks and just built like a brick house. And kind of right then and there, I looked at Jason Benetti and my producer, Bo Garrett and Alice. I'm like, yeah, this, this is a different Texas. This, this team is totally physically equipped to do this. And then to watch practice. And for 40 minutes, that ball didn't hit the ground once. I mean, and it wasn't walk through. I mean, they were going right with their shorts and t-shirts on but it was full speed to xavier and to the rest of them and i and like man quinn has not missed a throw 
I think in my years in the NFL, my six years there, we had two perfect Fridays in six years in Indianapolis and Seattle. So I know what a perfect Friday looks like, and they're hard to come by. And to see them do it before the season opener, kind of knew that this was a year they could take a turn, take that next step, get to the double-digit wins, and ultimately for the Longhorns, put themselves in this four-team tournament, which they all envisioned. Rock, um, tell Bo Garrett, Chip Brown said hi. He and I went to SMU together. That guy was like the intramural quarterback extraordinaire <laughs> for the freaking Fiji house. Yes. Um, but um, when you look at this matchup, what do you think it comes down to? Yeah. It's it's a very even matchup. I, I I mean, four points feels about right. I think both of these semifinals should be one score games. These two teams played against each other. I don't know if either of you gone back and either watched the TV copy or the game tape of this game last year. Yeah. And I mean, it was I mean, Texas didn't run the ball. They didn't yeah. I, I didn't I didn't feel like they were in their personality in this game. And yep. part of it was because B. John Robinson and Roshan Johnson weren't playing. And now players have said we kind of found our new identity in that game without them, um, even in the loss. But, I mean, they the only 100-yard receiver in the game was Casey Kane. <laughs> yeah. I, I don't mean, think that'll be the case Monday, right? I, I, don't right. Think he'll, no, no. I don't think he'll be the one. But it's funny. I watched it, and I'm like, okay. It's kind of like my 14-year-old son who's still sleeping as we're taping this and, and talking right now. Um, that Okay, I can see what it's going to be, right? Like, I, I okay, I can see that, you know, he might be like 6'6 one day and he's kind of got these huge hands and big feet and he's kind of in this little awkward stage right now. And when I watched that game, I was like, yeah, these guys kind of look pubescent. And if they can take that step physically, if they can grow together in their culture. And for Washington, you're talking about nine sixth-year seniors that have all been there. That's not even including Penix, who came in from afar. That's nine guys that have been through Chris Peterson and now Kalen DeBoer and didn't transfer and didn't leave and didn't opt out and wanted to be a part of that program. And kind of like Texas, you watch them grow up. I watched, I walked in that building and the eye test was overwhelming. You go onto the Husky practice field and you're like, grown man, grown man, grown man, grown man. NFL, 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 and, you know, both of them are loaded with NFL dudes, with grownups that are professionals now uh, that have just overcome some some obstacles over the course of the season, close games for Washington, an early loss to Oklahoma for Texas, and both of them feel very much like they're built for this moment. The Alamo was kind of the, the fraternity house, right? That was kind of the college years, and now they're grownups, and now they're playing on the big stage in an NFL stadium, and this is going to feel like an NFL game Monday night. Yeah, I completely agree, Brock. Uh, Kalen DeBoer just seems like a guy that's always won, and I always marvel in the guy that's got it from the mud, came from the D2 ranks, yep. and has obviously proven himself now at Washington, getting his team in the college football playoff. Talk about the job that he's done in the Pacific Northwest. Yeah, it reminds me a lot of Lance Leipold, and you watched Kansas the other night and uh, the turnaround that he has made at Kansas. Didn't have to make that big a turnaround. I mean, the cupboards were not bare. Roma Dunze was in there. Jalen Millen was in there. There were pieces in there some of the dishware was in the cupboards ready to go um although jimmy lake ran at a ground at four and eight and that had a lot more to do with just the failures of culture and a first-time head coach Kalen's like lance leipold time on task you know like like lance at wisconsin whitewater and at buffalo and at kansas he's had the same people surrounding him and you look at Kalen DeBoer and Ryan Grubb, they go back to that D2 level. You look at Kalen DeBoer and Chuck Morrell as defensive signal caller. They go back to that D2 level. They have had so much time together. And when you have that continuity, you have what they like to say in business, the speed of trust. You can come in there day one and it's not like, okay, I got to learn you. You got to learn me. We got to learn. Nope. This is exactly how we're going to do it. We know how it works. We've done it at Fresno. We've done it at the D2 level. We've done it individually in some of the other places that Kalen have been at Eastern Michigan and Indiana. Like we know this works. And the players felt that. And that buy in was immediate. And uh, yeah, the run that they're on right now, what is it, 22 wins in a row is unbelievable. Nobody saw that coming. But it happens because of that time on task together as a staff and that sense of belief they brought in the door day number one. Brock, what's the aspect of Washington's football team that not enough people are talking about? Probably their fourth quarter defense. 
you know, to a man, you would take many more of the Texas defenders, right? The NFL will look at the Texas personnel defensively and say, yep, I want him. I want him. I want Murphy. I want Sweat. I want Jalen. You know, I, I really like your nickel. Um, I, I think Barron's a great player and is going to have a chance at the right fit at the NFL level to, to play a bunch of years. So the NFL would take more of Texas's defenders just personnel-wise, but the Washington defenders in Thule, Latuli Nasanoa in the middle, Braylon Trice, Guys on the back end, little Jabbar Muhammad, a transfer from Oklahoma State. They just have a, a knack. And Braylon will be a first or second round pick. He's a phenomenal player. And you guys will kind of see him. And gosh, going to be some great matchups on both your really good tackles down there at Texas. Um, but he's he's an absolute stud. And he would start for Texas. And maybe Jabbar, Jabbar would start a corner for Texas. But by and large, you take more of the Longhorns personnel, size, length, speed, all of those things. Yet Washington's crew in the fourth quarter and why they've won all these one score games over the course of the year is that defense just finds a way, find a way, you know, kind of ugly in the first half. And I expect the same. I mean, what did Quinn throw for in this game last year? 367. I think you're going to run RPOs. I think they're going to be plays in space. I think you're going to score points. I think all of that's going to happen. And it wouldn't surprise me if this game's in the 30s. But what Washington's defense has done now for six, seven weeks is they buckle down in the fourth quarter. They figured it out. They've made some adjustments in some of their scheme and some of their coverage and some of their pressure. But more, more than anything, they just like believe. Like, yeah, we can bend and we might get broken in the first couple quarters, but we find a way and we believe when it matters. It's kind of been the whole mantra to the team, but the defense has really taken that mantra in the fourth quarters over the second half of the season. Yeah. And in the tight ends, I don't they all have touchdown catches. So there's four of them. Yep. So Tell me about Washington's tight ends and when they come into play. Yeah, kind of sneaky. And those are some six-year seniors that have been there. Uh, Westover was a walk-on originally uh, from Mount Si High School, about 40 minutes outside of Seattle, out in North Bend, and just been a worker and a grinder and a perseverer. And I'm going to be here when it matters. And the dude just shows up like in the biggest moments, probably the best hands right there with Roma Dunze on the team. Like it's just, uh, and they don't feature him, but when his number is called, he delivers. Devin Culp is from the other side of the state, from a, a proud high school program called Gonzaga Prep, right outside of Spokane, a private school, Bishop Sankey, and it's put out some other, you know, NFL kind of guys. And and um, Devin is a, a six-year dude that's endured it. He's been a little immature in the Jimmy Lake years, was real immature and had to grow up and has grown up. And those two, yeah, when you talk about just the, the seasoning of these sixth year players and what they mean in the culture, that position group is where it resonates maybe the most because those are both just grownups that have been there that have a high care factor and want to see this deal get done this weekend. So what's, uh, I mean, do you have a prediction for the game? Yeah, I think it's going to be something like 34, 31, 31, 28, you know, um, big brother and I have been doing uh, and having some fun. Uh, older brother Damon works at the University of Washington, has since his 12 year career ended in the NFL. And, you know, he he referenced Bill Belichick and the two Super Bowls that he won as a backup with the Patriots. Uh, we've, you know, had Chris Peterson on our morning show. We've had McDonough this morning on our morning show. They all say the same things. Tackling, special teams, turnovers, not Quinn Ewers, not Michael Penix. Not Roma Dunze, not Xavier Worthy, not even, you know, our big 365-pound monster of a man in Tavondre Sweat. Not, not any of those. Tackling, special teams, turnovers. The one that wins those, the one that is better than the other in those, probably is the winner of a 35-31, 31-28 to me kind of game Monday night. And, yeah, the, the, the Huskies, I, I just think, much like it was against Oregon, they were nine-and-a-half-point underdogs. Nobody thought they could do it. Everybody thought Oregon was bigger and longer and faster and stronger. And yet, golly, give me a close game. These guys know how to win, those. So that, to me, is where the advantage would be if it's a close game in the fourth quarter Monday night. Brock, appreciate it so much. Appreciate you uh, making some time for us. This is going to be fun. It is going to be uh, super, super fun. I will text Bo. Bo loves you, Chip. He was telling stories. We were down there in Texas a couple different times over the course <laughs> of the season. I know you guys go way back. Love what you guys do. Love the Texas football program. Good to see them back um, and taking the step and being on the stage. And, yeah, I mean, I think we are in for a whale of two semifinals. And then ultimately, whatever championship game is left with the two teams standing, I think that will match up incredibly well, too. So have yeah. a great weekend, a happy new year, and uh, I know we'll all be enjoying Monday night. Thanks, Thanks Brock. Appreciate you, man. You got happy it, boys. New year.